principle is that choice has a very positive impact on well-being and on learning. First study I want to talk about expressing this is a study that was, it's a classic study in psychology that was done in a nursing home. Langer and Roden went into a nursing home and they gave the people one of two different communications. So half of the people were given a passivity inducing communication. They were told, you know, we're doing the best that we can to take good care of you here in the nursing home. We're always trying to figure out what we could do better. We've decided we're going to start showing movies on Tuesday and Thursday night, and we'll let you know which is your night to go. Oh, and we've bought these plants for you to keep in your room. Here's the plant for your room, and we're going to keep it right over here. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. It's just something to cheer up your room for you. And they went on for 20 minutes in this fashion, inducing a sense of passivity but caring. The other half of the people in this nursing home were given an agency-inspiring communication. So they were told something like, we're doing our best to take good care of you here in this nursing home, but it's your responsibility to let us know what we can do to make things better for you. We've decided we're going to start showing movies on Tuesday and Thursday night. You can decide if you'd like to go and which night. And also, we've bought these plants. Uh, you can choose a plant for your room if you'd like, keep it where you'd like, take care of it as you like, and so on for 20 minutes. Well, before these two communications, these two groups of people were about the same in terms of their level of activity, their level of alertness, their happiness, their sociability. But two weeks after this brief 20-minute communication, there were significant differences across the two groups, with the group that had heard the agency-inspiring communication being better on every dimension. Second study, uh, going to the other end of the lifespan, is with two-month-olds. In many psychology studies, particularly of um, memory and of a sense of uh, self as agent, they will put um, mobiles above babies' cribs that the babies will look up at and they can operate in some studies by turning their head against a pressure sensitive pillow and in other cases by kicking a foot that has a string attached. So, so in s some of the babies then can operate these mobiles and other babies cannot. The mobiles just go on at random points during the day. What they found is that babies who have control over their mobiles show much more positive affect and interaction with those mobiles than babies that, that can't control them themselves. And second of all, when they're put in a new situation where all babies can control their mobiles, the ones that could control them in the first situation very quickly figure out that they can control the new one and start to, whereas babies who could not control the mobile in the first place never figure it out. So in other words, the sense that you can control things and change things transfers from one situation to another, as does a sense that you can't, even when you later could. Third study supporting the positive impact of a sense of choice is a study looking at proficiency with proofreading. So people were given a, a task in which they had to find errors in a paper. And they were all under particular conditions of noise. So they're hearing a noise in the background that I imagine to be something like beep, 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 like when a truck is backing up. And half of the people were told, you know, I'm really sorry about the noise. If it's really bothering you, just push this button and, and we'll stop it. We'd rather not, but if you need us to, we will. The other half were told, gee, we're really sorry about that noise. There's nothing we can do about it. Just do the best you can. Well, nobody stopped the noise. So they're all listening to the same noise, but the people in the first group who think they can stop the noise found significantly more errors in the proofreading task than did the other group. In this study, they also used an unsolvable tangram task where people have to put together shapes to produce other shapes. And the people in the first group also spent significantly longer trying to solve the tangram task. So they showed more persistence just because they believed they had control over this terrible noise. And these findings all are sustained in classroom research as well. They don't just occur in laboratory and nursing home and crib type situations. They also occur in classrooms where children who believe that they have more control over their classroom situations also write better essays and, and do better in many ways in classrooms. And it's not just that the teachers are able to give more control to children who are higher functioning, because when teachers are trained to give children more of a sense of control in the classroom, then children's performance goes up. Manasari saw all this. She said, our individual education is based on the free choice of the child. Many of the materials even are about the child making choices and decisions. But on the macro level, as I said, the child walks into the classroom in the morning and thinks, gee, 
I think I'd like to go work on my color tablets today. Or gee, I'd like to go and work more on um, a report that I was writing today. Now, it's not quite as free as you might think. So uh, recently I was at a school in Texas and they told me about a 17-year-old coming back to the school that she had graduated from at 14 and saying, you know, you all really had us fooled when I was here because we really thought we had control over things. But now that I look back, I realize how much the teacher really was in control of things. So, so the teacher is sitting back and noticing if a child is following up on their lessons, noticing if they're getting to all areas of the curriculum. And if a child isn't, then the teacher will, in as uncontrolling of a, a manner as she can for that or he can for that individual child, will come in and assert some control. So they may, for example, say, gee, I noticed that you haven't followed up on that grammar lesson that I gave you the other day. When did you plan to do that? And the child will need to come up with a time on their own, but it gives the child a sense of control. Or at, at the very um, end of the spectrum, a teacher might need to say something to a child like, gee, you haven't been getting to your grammar work, and we've tried other ways to get you to do this. You're going to need to start doing that first thing in the morning for half an hour. So the teacher will exert control as, as needed. The key element for Montessori is that the child is behaving in a way that's constructive for themselves and their own development, and also is constructive for the social community. So Montessori said, the liberty of the child should have as its limit the collective interest as its form what we universally consider good behavior. Children aren't free to go climb on the walls. They aren't free to go poke each other and distract each other. They're free to behave constructively. However, she also saw that overabundance, that too much choice, debilitates and retards progress. So there's a limit to the materials in the Montessori classroom. In, in essence, there's a particular set of materials that Montessori saw children were able to work their way through in about three years, the three years that they're in each classroom. And you don't add in materials or take out materials beyond that particular set. Um, some of the materials are stored in the closet, the materials that children aren't using, but, but you don't just add in and take out willy-nilly. Now, there's research, again, supporting this insight that she had that too much choice is not good. So, for example, in a Menlo Park grocery store, a study was done where gourmet jams were out for people to try. And sometimes there were six jams for people to try, and other times there were 24 jams for people to try. And what they found was when there were 24 different gourmet jams to try, people were much less likely to buy a jam. And then when they did buy a jam, they were significantly less satisfied with what they'd bought than when they only had to choose among six. And what I find especially surprising about the study is that it even held true for gourmet chocolates. <laughs> so people didn't even want to bring free chocolate home at the end of the study when they had to choose among 24 different gourmet chocolates. We also, they also found the same thing with Stanford undergraduates when they had to write, um, a, when they were given the option to write an extra, an extra credit essay at the end of an exam. When they had six different choices of essays, they were significantly more likely to write one than when they had 24 choices. And they also wrote significantly better essays when they had fewer choices. Barry Schwartz has uh, capitalized on all this in a recent book that came out called The Paradox of Choice, in which he talks about the great difficulty of going into a, a Gap jeans store and trying to buy some blue jeans, because there are just far too many choices. Do you want the bell bottom? Do you want the faded? Do you want the holes in them? And, and so on. So Montessori saw that overabundance debilitates and retards progress. And the choice that a child has in a Montessori classroom actually is limited. They're limited to the materials that they've already been shown how to do, and they're, they're limited in the sense that they're moving along in a curriculum and there's a particular area that would make the most sense for them to work in 